Today on Pilgrim Radio's His People, Ben Freeth, on the injustices he and his family have endured in the African country of Zimbabwe. But as we were stripped of any kind of assistance from the police force, from, from anyone else, from the courts, and our faith gradually grew and grew and grew because we realized that without God, we could do nothing. Without God, there was no protection. Without God, um, we were completely, completely lost. Ben Freeth, next. It's a situation you may not be aware of. Thousands of white families and many more black families have been driven from their farms in the African nation of Zimbabwe under leader Robert Mugabe. Ben Freeth and his family were driven from their farm a few years ago. But as a believer, these events, as difficult as they were, have been used by God to strengthen his faith. He's written about his experiences in the book Mugabe and the White African, which is also the title of a film documentary. Mr. Freeth, tell us about Zimbabwe's location in Africa and how you and your family came to be there. That's quite a long story, but, but yeah, Zimbabwe is, um, is a landlocked country uh, north of South Africa, um, surrounded by seven other African countries. Um, and we ended up there, well... My father was actually in the British Army, and, and he ended up here just shortly after independence, um, which took place in 1980. Um, and my wife's family have been in Africa the last 300 years. Um, well, just less than 300 years. years time, it will be 300 years. Um, and, and farming for all that time. So um, my wife's family, a very long-lived African family, um, uh, my family, uh, we're, we're fairly uh, new to this continent. Now, up until fairly recently, uh, obviously you mentioned your wife comes from a farming family, and, and your family, of course, you and your wife and, and were farmers. W what kind of farming uh, did you do? We had a farm uh, in a place called Chigutu, which is where I am, in fact, talking right now, uh, under African sky, looking up at the stars. And um, the the farm was about 15 kilometers away from, from where I'm standing right now. Uh, we had mangoes, um, we had citrus, uh, different kinds of oranges. We had uh, maize, uh, which you call corn. Um, we had sunflowers. Um, and then we also had a, a safari area on the farm. Um, my father-in-law was, was very keen on the wildlife and conserving the wildlife and bringing wildlife populations that needed protecting onto the farm. And so we had a small safari lodge on the farm um, along with about 500 different animals, giraffe, bagel, um, impala, zebra, wildebeest, you know, a lot of the, the, the different beautiful animals that we get here in Africa. Um, so it was a, a very mixed farm. Um, very diverse and uh, a very productive farm as well. We, we used to employ about um, uh, 50 permanent employees and then during fruit picking season, um, another 100 people or, or so. So it was, it was quite a um, productive farm, yeah. And up until recently, uh, my understanding is that thousands of other white families like yours also owned farms in Zimbabwe? Yeah, as a, as a white population, we um, owned about 20% of the land in Zimbabwe. Um, and we have had a pretty hard time as of about the year 2000. Uh, so the last 11 years have been um, pretty tough, where because we were employing a lot of people, um, the ruling party, John of PS, led by Robert Mugabe, 
um, has been uh, trying to intimidate all those people that have been working for us and trying to get us out of the equation so that they can intimidate them uh, without uh, without the media knowing, without the courts being uh, accessed, um, because when the farm workers are, are kind of on their own uh, and they are made poor and they're made hungry, it's very difficult for them to get access to the outside world. And so they're easily intimidated. Um, and we, we've had a pretty tough time with a lot of a lot of getting killed, getting beaten, getting their houses burned down, um, and being chased being chased off the land. So it, it's a pretty traumatic 11 years for a lot of people. So in the year 2000, uh, the, the president there, Robert Mugabe, uh, introduced some kind of a law that began to uh, enable the government to seize the farms from the white farmers? Um, what actually happened in 2000 was there was a referendum um, for a new constitution. And in, in the new constitution, it was entrenching Robert Mugabe's power. Um, and the sweetener was to try to um, get the people to support that by the new constitution saying that they could take the land from the whites for free for, with no compensation. Now, the people actually voted no to that constitution. They said no, that, that this was wrong. Um, and that they didn't want this new constitution. And, and we had a, a parliamentary election and a presidential election coming up in, in June of that year, uh, about four months later. And so what happened was the war veterans from the Liberation War in the 70s, along with a whole lot of paid militia youth, were sent out onto the farms to ensure that the farm workers uh, couldn't swing the vote in any way. And so there was a, a tremendous amount of violence that was meted out against both farmers and farm workers um, from February 2000 or March 2000 uh, onwards, um, a, a, particularly as we got to any new uh, election um, in 2002 and 2005, particularly in 2008, where there was tremendous violence meted out against the people of the country for, so that the ruling party could stay in power and ensure that no one dared to vote against them. So um, uh, there were various laws brought in at the same time, uh, only a little bit later, um, but mostly the evictions have taken place in a lawless manner without any recourse to a proper legal process. How many uh, families, white families, lost their farms uh, during that time? Uh, there were about 4,000 white-owned farms, um, and obviously they were on quite a few of those farms, white managers as well. So it amounts to probably about 20,000 white people losing their homes, losing their livelihoods. Um, but uh, there's an awful lot more black people who have lost their homes and livelihoods. Um, we're looking at uh, in excess of a million um, black people who have lost their homes and their livelihoods as a result of what's been going on. And my understanding is that w while that has been going on in Zim uh, Zimbabwe, the police really didn't do anything to stop it? Absolutely. You know, it, it was very frustrating for us um, as as people that should have the protection of the law to have these kind of situations developing where there was threat to life and threat to property. Um, and reports are made to police and say hey, there's nothing we can do. This is political um, and therefore we can do nothing about it. Um, and suddenly... We were all left very much in the lurch, very, very much without any kind of recourse to any kind of protection from the law enforcers within the country. And, and it's a tremendously um, difficult thing to suddenly realize that you are all on your own. And, um, you know, we, we were very fortunate in that we had a faith, a strong faith in God before all this. But as we were stripped of any kind of assistance from the police force, from, from anyone else, from the courts. Um, 
our faith gradually grew and grew and grew because we realized that without God, we could do nothing. Without God, there was no protection. Without God, um, we were completely, completely lost. Well, my guest today on His People, Mr. Ben Freeth, uh, he's talking to us from uh, Zimbabwe uh, in Chiguchu, uh, Zimbabwe. He's author of the book uh, Mugabe and the White African, and he's talking about how uh, thousands lost uh, their homes in Zimbabwe beginning in the year 2000, uh, thousands of white families and um, many more uh, black families, black people as well. The effects on your family, uh, Ben, have been have been very large. Uh, talk about the effects on your family, uh, your wife's family, and I understand you're not farming anymore. Also, if you would tell us what you're doing today. Yeah, well, we, we took the um, unprecedented step of taking Robert Mugabe to court. Um, we realized that what was going on was wrong. Um, obviously, there was a tremendous amount of fear from ev everyone uh, in doing anything against uh, what was going on because everyone realized that, you know, if you took Mugabe to court, if you did anything against what was going on, the likelihood was that you would probably get killed. Um, and so we uh, took the step knowing that uh, as Christians we have to stand for what is right and we have to take the consequences of whatever that, whatever, uh, that means. You know, there's an old saying, if good men uh, do nothing, then evil will prevail. And you see it so often in the world, good men doing nothing and evil prevail. And, and we just, uh, it was just put on our hearts that we, we had to do this thing. We had to take Mugabe to court. Um, and it's very rare for a dictator in any country to be taken to court. So we ended up uh, in an international court in the Sedek Tribunal, which was based in Vintuk in, in Namibia. And, um, and we had a pretty hard the result. We, we knew there would be consequences in taking Mugabe to court, and uh, just before the main hearing of the case, we were all abducted, my, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, and myself. Um, the, my wife and, and the children managed to escape, and we were abducted, taken off to a militia camp where they were training the youth um, in the 2008 uh, election time. And we were very, very severely beaten, you know, between the three of us. Uh, we sustained many broken bones, um, 13 broken bones between the three of us. And we were smashed. Uh, you know, I, I had uh, rifle butts beating me over the head uh, and had a, a badly fractured skull. Um, and it was, a, it was a pretty difficult uh, night that we had. Um, and what they wanted was for us to sign a bit of paper to say that we would stop going to court, that we, would, uh, we wouldn't go to the main hearing, that we would withdraw from the tribunal. Um, and uh, anyway, my father-in-law was, was pretty well unconscious a lot of the time. I was unconscious and, and in and out of consciousness. So was a, a situation of, of the very severe duress. But in our hearts and in our minds, uh, it was very clear that we would carry on. God had put it on our hearts that we would carry on. Anyway, from there, it, 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 also, it carried on. Um, we, God saved us, and we managed to get medical uh, assistance and, and, and get back on our feet again. Um, but as our crop was ready... The following year, in 2009, the whole mango crop, the citrus crop, the maize crop, the sunflower crop, um, the Mugabe thugs came in and they stole our tractors, they stole our fertilizer, they stole our, they stole our chemicals, they stole our workshop equipment, they drove my parents in law out of their house, and then they stole all our crops. And it went on for months while we were still in our house on the farm. Um, the police would do absolutely nothing. And it was a very, very trying time for us because they would come round our house at night, they would beat drums. Uh, 
on a couple of occasions they actually broke into the house and, and tried to terrorize us. They bowed up our driveway. They did everything to, to intimidate us, Point, pointed guns through our windows, chased all our workers away, um, and, and beat our workers up very badly. Um, and it was, a, it was a very, very trying time, a very, very extremely difficult time um, to go through. And it was only by the grace of God that we were able to, to carry on through that time and to carry on each day. Um, but finally what happened uh, towards the end of 2009 was, was they burned down, or they, they set a, a fire just to the south of our house. We were at church at the time, and there was a big wind uh, blowing from the south going towards our house um, and towards our workers' houses. House was attached house, a grass roof, um, and first of all, the fire hit our workers' houses, which were also thatched roofs, and, uh, and down, and then hit our house uh, and burnt our house down with with everything in it. Um, and then they burnt my parents-in-law's house down uh, three days later. Um, so we haven't been on the farm since 2009, since late 2009, um, but we carry on. Uh, fighting for what is right, fighting on, fighting on for um, God's principles um, in a land which has been uh, devastated by what has happened. You go back to our farm now, um, uh, there's, there's virtually nothing going on, even though they've got all our tractors, even though they've got a, you know, everything that we ever owned. Um, uh, there's, there's virtually nothing going on. And our workers are in living in absolute poverty now. So it's, it's, we, it's been a tough time. But, you know, I think so often we get so hung up with our material things. But God is far bigger than material things. As my father-in-law always used to say, there's no pockets in a shroud. And the one certainty in life is that every single one of us is going to die. Yep. And we have to be prepared for that. And having lost all our things... Um, you know, we walked out of the, off the farm just in the, in the set of places that we were in. That, that was it. We didn't have a toothbrush even. Um, we have realized that those things are, are not actually very important. You know, those things can be replaced. Um, but God, if we know how much he loves us, no one can ever take from us. The big question is, uh, one of the big questions, as you've described, you're, you're Christians, you believe that God was uh, leading you to stay there, to stand against injustice, but uh, some might say, well, why, why not leave? Why not move to South Africa or, or go somewhere where it's more friendly? You know, a lot of people have left, um, and I don't blame any one of those people for, for leaving. Um, God doesn't necessarily call us... Uh, out of situations, he calls us into situations, and we haven't been called into any other situation than the situation that we are in at the moment. Um, and so we believe that we are here to be the salt and the light, as, as Jesus wants us to be, as Jesus taught us to be, uh, in the situation that we are in. Um, this is our home, this is uh, where our children were born, um, this is a place that needs Christians, it needs people who know what is right to stand for what is right. And um, it's not everyone's calling, uh, and I accept that fully. But for us, it, it has been a calling, and, and so we are here to try to make whatever difference that we, that we possibly can um, for what is right and for God. And Jesus' command, Jesus' words to love your enemies, those perhaps became more real for you than... For, for most people in their lives. Indeed. Um, that, that night that we were abducted and, and taken off to the militia camp it was a, a pretty hard night. And uh, up until then, I found it very difficult. You know, Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies. Um, and I was finding it very, very difficult to love people that were doing these kind of things to uh, our workers, doing it to our friends, doing it to us. Um, you know, and that night when enough 
so severely when they had thrust a burning stick down my mother-in-law's throat, when they had done terrible things. Um, it, it was very difficult. It's very difficult to find love for your enemies. You know, how do you do it? It's, it's not a natural thing. Um, the natural reaction of a human being is, is to feel a lot of hatred and, and, and bitterness and uh, anger and, and destructive things within them um, against people that are doing these kind of things. Uh, and, and that's natural. And, and, but that night, I was lying on the ground. They tied me up really, really tightly and they were beating me um, with a shambok, which is a, a hippo hide whip. Um, and as I say, I'd, I'd already got several broken bones by then. And, uh, and they, they left off beating me for a while, and, and, and then they picked me up by my belt, and they were now beating me with a shambok on the soles of my feet. And it was incredibly painful. And then they left off for a while, and, and, and I was just lying in the dust, and uh, my feet were tied, my hands were tied very, very tightly. And, uh, and I just saw all these feet around me. And um, that verse from Jesus, from the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies, just came into my heart almost physically. It was, it was the most incredible thing. And, and I just had this incredible love for these people that were doing these terrible things to me and to my family. And I reached out. It was a spontaneous rea reaction. It was uh, nothing that I'd thought about. It was something that came straight from my heart. I reached out with my hands that were tied, and I touched the first pair of uh, black legs that were standing there, and I said, May the Lord Jesus bless you. And then I reached out to the second pair. May the Lord Jesus bless you. And the next pair, and the next pair. May the Lord Jesus bless you. And it was... The most incredibly freeing experience um, that took place within me that, that night as I asked the Lord Jesus to